The late 80s were a difficult time for some high-profile rock musicians who enjoyed success a decade or several years prior. Rock and roll bad boy Ted Nugent's career seemed pretty quiet during this time, and some people even counted him out. But he wasn't the only one struggling at the time, as former Styx frontman and guitarist Tommy Shaw was embarking on a solo career, having released three albums, while Night Ranger's bassist Jack Blades was reeling with the breakup of his band. It would seem strange that three musicians having lulls in their career would become an attractive prospect to one of the biggest A&R men in the music industry, but that's what happened. Today, let's take a look at the history of Damn Yankees. Geffen and our man John Kaladner seemed like an expert in reviving struggling musicians' careers. He helped Aerosmith and Whitesnake reinvent themselves, and he had the same plan for Tommy Shaw, Jack Blades, and Ted Nugent. He would tell Ultimate Classic Rock, I just had this idea. I think I had dinner with Jack Blades or maybe Tommy Shaw, and for some reason, I got in this mindset. I knew Ted Nugent well, and he wasn't really doing anything. Night Ranger wasn't really doing anything, and Tommy Shaw was kind of in and out with sticks. So I came up with this crazy idea to have the three of them have a supergroup. Ted Nugent would establish himself in the 70s as one of the bad boys of rock and roll. But like many musicians who were popular during that decade, by the 80s, musical tastes had changed and newer sounds and bands had taken over. Tommy Shaw, meanwhile, would front the pop rock and adult-oriented group Styx, where he would clash with Dennis DeYoung over the band's sound. Jack Blades, meanwhile, cut his teeth singing, playing bass, and writing songs for Night Ranger, but the record label, according to him, destroyed the band, telling the LA Times in 1991, Sister Christian, Night Ranger's big 1984 hit, was a ballad, and from that point on, Blades recalled, our record company only allowed us to release more ballads, and that really destroyed a good rock and roll band, he'd say. The origins of Damn Yankees dated back to 1988, when Shaw and Nugent were sitting together at a music show business dinner in Florida. Following the meal, Shaw told Nugent, according to the Chicago Tribune, when it was over, we were saying, why don't we get together after we finish promoting our records? It would be Shaw and his manager who called up Kaliner's office asking for Nugent's number, and Kaliner would claim that Nugent thought the idea initially was stupid, but after much convincing, he gave it a try. The early days of 1988 initially saw Shaw and Nugent jamming together on acoustic guitars and coming up with the song Come Again, which ended up on the group's debut album. At that time, the band had a stand-in player on bass, and while Nugent and Shaw fell chemistry, Kaladner felt like the band was missing something. That's when he enlisted Jack Blades of Night Ranger fame. Blades would tell the LA Times in the same 1991 interview, After we finished doing our last album, we basically broke up because they picked up our option to do another album and we refused, because they would have stuffed us into the garbage can again. Three days later, a friend of mine told me Ted and Tommy were rehearsing over in New York City, and he said, hey, why don't you go and see what it's like? So I flew to New York three days after Night Ranger broke up, and the next thing I knew, the damn Yankees were happening. Blades would admit he didn't think musically the band would work out because Shaw and Nugent seemed like polar opposites in terms of their styles. Of course, his opinion changed once he got into a rehearsal space with the pair, and the key to the band's chemistry and success lied in Nugent restraining his guitar playing with Kaladner telling Ultimate Classic Rock, Ted Nugent knows that I was one of his biggest fans and I spoke always in that way. During the formation and early rehearsals of the band, I told him he was going to have to like calm his ass down. Everybody knows he's a great guitar player, but it's not that kind of band. So he was really going to have to think about not playing over or the band would be a failure. By 1989, the trio, along with Tommy Shaw's drummer, Michael Cardellone, would start writing songs and rehearsing. And several of the early songs written were the tracks High Enough and Coming of Age. Kaladner knew the band had potential and shopped them around to his home at Geffen Records, but they felt they had enough corporate rock bands on their roster. Other labels saw the band as a tough sell. Blades would tell the LA Times they weren't listening to the music and its potential. All they were concerned about was potential problems. In addition to that, the labels were concerned about the optics of three rockers who are now in their 30s and 40s, appearing too old or not being relevant anymore. They were worried rock radio wouldn't play them in addition to MTV. Blades would tell the Times, if we had been in our early 20s with that same demo tape, I don't think we would have had any trouble getting a deal. The band would end up signing a deal with Warner Brothers, and Damn Yankees would head into the studio in late 1989 with producer Ron Nevison. Nevison had previously worked with Led Zeppelin and The Who, and he was scheduled to work with Night Ranger before the band disbanded, so he was always in Jack Blades' mind. Nevison, for his part, wasn't one to mince words, and it resulted in him butting heads with Nugent over the mix of the album. He always felt that Ted's guitar was too out front in the mix, and Nugent would recall to Ultimate Classic Rock, 
My app wasn't even on yet, and he hit the talkback button from the control room, and he goes, Ted, you're going to have to turn it down a little bit. I haven't even played anything yet, he'd say. Within a week or so, the band would wrap up recording on their debut album. Released in 1990, critics seemed indifferent to their debut record, but it did little to sway the public and rock radio. A representative for KNAC, FM, and Long Beach would tell the Times, fans have responded to the fact that this is a real all-star group featuring musicians they're familiar with. Age wasn't a factor, particularly since classic rock is so big. What also helped is that the band is a strong live band, they'd say. The album would have five singles that charted on the Billboard rock charts, and several that had crossover appeal, including High Enough, Come Again, Coming of Age, Runaway, and Bad Reputation. The album would be certified multi-platinum. In 1991, the band would hit the road opening for Bad Company and received stellar reviews, often upstaging the headliners. The Pittsburgh Press would write in one review headline, Nugent and Band Outgun Bad Company, while a paper from St. Louis would claim the same year, Bad Company Boring Compared to Damn Yankees. The band would return in 1992 with their follow-up record, Don't Tread. The album would be certified gold, but underperformed compared to their first album. It would, however, give the band their second highest charting single of their career with Where Are You Going Now? Kalitner summed up the change in attitude on their sophomore record, telling Ultimate Classic Rock, they want to just make an easy second record and collect the money from Warner Brothers. Also hampering the band were changing musical tastes as alternative rock was becoming more popular. MTV would put the group's single Don't Tread On Me in light rotation on the network, but Nugent was suspicious of MTV telling the Chicago Tribune in 1992, I gotta tell you, I don't like what I see on MTV. I haven't watched a segment of MTV that I could stomach. It reminds me of AM radio in the early 60s. It's as formulated as that was. Also not helping the album was that the tour to support the record had to be rescheduled due to Nugent's hunting schedule. He would tell the Chicago Tribune in 1992, Certainly it's no secret that my outdoor hunting is not a hobby or recreation with me. It's really a lifestyle. And damn, if the release of our album doesn't coincide with the beginning of hunting season. By 1994, Nugent wanted to go solo again, leaving Sean Blades to form their own group named Shaw Blades, who put out the 1995 album Hallucination. The supergroup would reunite in 1998 and 2010, and in 1999, John Kalidner attempted to reunite the band for a new album for his label, Portrait Records, but Shaw had gotten back with Sticks, and that prevented the band from releasing their third album. Kalidner would tell Melodic Rock about the failed third record, I didn't think it was quite good enough, and that time with 80s style rock, you'd have to come up with something pretty spectacular. I was disappointed in the record, mostly because of Tommy Shaw's non-participation, he'd say. In 2020, Tommy Shaw was interviewed by Eddie Trunk and was asked about a possible reunion, saying, well, we never broke up, we were all still best of friends, so who knows. It's hard because with Sticks we work so much, and to do a damn Yankees reunion, it would mean putting the members of Sticks out of work for a while, so it's a tough one, but every once in a while we wind up on the same stage. In a separate interview in 2014, Nugent would maintain that the band members are still friends, but hunting is still a big part of his life, and making any commitment to Damn Yankees would make it difficult to reform for a long-term tour. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.